Father in heaven, bless us in this coming series, the story of the Exodus. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, before we get into the plagues and the Exodus itself, uh, I must give you a historical background so you'll appreciate the story of the Exodus a little better. Tell me, was there a time prophecy connected to the flood? Yeah. Genesis 6 verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The word Methuselah means when he dies, the flood will come. Was there a time prophecy to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. Was there a specific time prophecy concerning the Exodus? Yes, and this is what we're going to study. Returning of the exiles to Jerusalem? Yes. First coming of Christ? Yes. The time for the, the investigative judgment to begin? Yes. What about the second coming? No. Silence is eloquent. The Bible doesn't say anything about the time of the second coming, but it's very near. My daughter Loretta and I got onto a very old Iraqi bus in Baghdad, the capital, at two o'clock in the morning. After six hours drive, we, re we reached the Zikhar route of uh, Urnamu in southern Iraq. It's the biggest of its kind in the Middle East. It's called Tel El Mukayar. And there you see the location of Ur of the Chaldees. What do these cuneiform writings tell us? Any Bible characters mentioned here? Nehemiah 9.7 says, You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeas and gave him the name Abraham. So you're looking at the site where God called Abram. When I was there, they showed us this uh, restored dwelling and they reckon this is where Abram lived. Abram was a prince, brilliant man. What uh, were the only two religions of antiquity? Polytheism, worshipping many gods, or monotheism, worshipping the God that created heavens and earth. I walked these steps, not to go and pray up there, but just to look at this beautiful edifice. But who walked here in ancient times? People who worship Nana, the moon god. Who did the polytheists worship? They had many gods. That's the meaning of the word polytheist. Many gods, but here moon worship and Shamash worship, the sun, were very prominent. This is the Nabunidas Chronicle. What was his son's name? Can you remember? Belshazzar. Who did he worship during the night of his death? He worshipped. Sin, the moon god, here at Urud was called Nana. What discovery concerning the kind of worship Nabudinus practiced on top? They made a very interesting discovery. Come with me to the British Museum. I like to visit the sites and then go to the museums and to see what uh, was found here. Found here. Blue glazed bricks in the British Museum. These are for the, from the time of Abram. The Zikarut was rebuilt, collapsed after a while, by Nabonidus in 560 BC, using these very bricks from the time of Abram to erect a shrine. Name of the shrine on the top, shrine dedicated to Nana 
the moon god. Now for some shocking news. And what I'm going to show you here helps you to realize why God does certain things. Listen to this. The king or priest would give oracles after, listen to this, intercourse in the temple with the spirit beings. Vulgar, isn't it? Abraham refused to participate in the abomination of the moon cult. It was a degraded religion. Was he the sole monotheist survivor? I often think about this. And I think he was. And God called him to revive the worship of monotheism in the ancient world. Caption at the foundation of the ziggurat, it says, the temple whose top is in heaven. The temple whose top is in heaven. Where in the Bible do we find these words of arrogance? I love researching this kind of thing. Genesis 11 verse 4, I'm sitting at the place where the ancient Tower of Babylon was built. It's also called the Etemanonki, foundation of heaven and earth. It says here, and they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Does that remind you of another being who said, I will get my aboding place, place up in heaven? Yes, Lucifer. So here is something satanic. At Ur, where people listened to the diabolic oracles of demons, Abram also listened to a voice, but it was the voice of God. Acts 7, 2 and 3, and he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. How does one understand God's command? Come out of here, my son. Makes sense. He had to get out of this polytheistic mess. God calls us away from exposure from evil. Come out of here, my son. Does it make sense? There's still a call in Revelation 18 of coming out. He listened to the voice of God, left the sinful way of life, wealth and comfort of Ur, and became the first missionary to leave Babylonia. His message to the polytheistic world, the lamb upon the altar. Here you have Christ. Abram also obeyed the laws of God, grace and obedience, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So wherever he erected an altar, it was a pulpit, and the heathen came and was converted. Type, anti-type. End time church will also uplift the Lamb, of God. Why did Abram tarry at Haran on his way to Canaan? God didn't want him at Haran. He wanted him in Canaan. Why do we at times only go halfway? The Lord is so patient with us. He was so patient with Abram. Did he receive a second call at Haran to leave this area and move to the promised land? Looking at the ruins where he once lived, my heart was touched by God's promises to Abram. Why? Genesis 12, 1 and 2 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, 
to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Now tell me, is this an isolated message spoken to a man who lived long ago? Or is God speaking to you and me through this verse of scripture? Is the Bible personal or impersonal? Soteriology, typology, eschatology. Soter from the word, Greek word soter, which means redeemer. Typology, something small pointing to something big later down the stream of time. And eschatology, end time. So when we study the Bible, let's look for these themes. It will enrich your Bible study. Meaning of, I will bless you. Not only Abram, but you who listen to the message. This promise included both temporal and spiritual blessings, particularly the latter. Paul clearly includes justification by faith among the blessings that rested on Abram. And you know, if you've got the assurance of salvation, you are wealthy. Galatians 3, 6 and 7. Even as Abram believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, the gospel in the time of Abram, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the same, the same are the children of Abram. Do you want to be a child of Abram? Believe that God can save someone like you. Make your name great? What does that mean? Erecting ziggurats? No. True greatness was the result from compliance with God's commands and cooperation with his divine purpose. The builders of Babel and Ur had thought they make themselves a name by defying God, and yet not one of their names has survived. Don't try and make a name for yourself. Uplift Christ. The name Abram is a common is common as personal as a personal name even today. It was a common name in those days and now as well. I did research on the occurrence of the name Abram in ancient literature. Mohammedans, Jews and Christians alike have acclaimed him in times past. They still look back to him as their spiritual ancestor. So Abram belongs to our planet. From Haran, God also speaks to you and me. Blessings he pronounced on Abram are also pronounced on those who are willing to obey and follow him all the way. Beautiful. Do we need these blessings? Oh yes. We live among curses and we need God's blessings. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What kind of blessing could this be? And are you and me included in these blessings? Such an assurance was the highest pledge of friendship and favor God could bestow upon Abram. It was a personal encounter with God. God considered as done to himself the insults and wrongs done to his friend. And this is the kind of friendship God wants to, to create between you and him. Would you like to have such a relationship with God? This is what I desire. He promised to share his friends 
and to treat his enemies as if they were his own. Abram was called the friend of God. James 2 verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abram believed God that he could save him, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Do you want to be the friend of God? Believe that he can save a sinner like you. God wants us to believe it. What was Tel Balata called previously? Of course, Jacob was here, Abram was here. Shechem, Shechem. People of long ago may have asked him, Who are you? And he would say, I'm Abram, the friend of God. Can we say that? I'm so and so. I'm a friend of God. What a testimony. Loretta, my child, says, God wants you and me to be his very special friends. Do not deny him your friendship. There is not a friend like the lovely Jesus. And to think that the King of Kings wants to have a friendship with you and me. This is tremendous. He will never fail you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Was the earth cursed before? Yes. Genesis 3.17 then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You know, choices are so important. Consequences are so enduring. The curse that, that had come because of the unfaithfulness of one man. Just one man. And the curse came. How did it affect the entire human race? Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. In Adam, our representative, we all sinned. We need a saviour. How can the curse caused by one man be reversed? We call this corporate identity, where one stands for a multitude. Romans 5, 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, Jesus, many will be made righteous. I have a choice, the first Adam or the second Adam. As his spiritual offspring, we may share in the blessing imparted to Abram. Galatians 3.29 And if you are Christ's, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. God made many promises to Abram. And if I belong to Christ, I'm an heir to all these wonderful promises. What a precious salvation theme. At Shechem, I thought of how fortunate we are. All the promises made to Abram are ours through faith. God wants us to trust him, to have faith in his ability to save sinners like you and me. The curse pronounced upon the ground because of sin, Christ has changed into a blessing for all men. Soon we will be walking on streets of gold, symbol of God's cancellation of the curse. All further promises to the patriarchs and Israel either clarified or amplified the promise of salvation offered the entire human race 
in the first promise made to Abram. Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord had said to Abram, and he's speaking to you and me, maybe we should take notice of what he says. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. Who comes first? God. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now according to Paul, the promise of deliverance made to Abram at Haran would be fulfilled 430 years later. And this is a great promise. This is the promise of deliverance from the slave nation of Egypt. Promises included a son as heir, possession of Canaan, prospect of becoming a great nation, and progenitor of the Messiah. Galatians 3.16 Now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. God does not say, and to the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Genesis is a Christ-centered book. Abram was God's chosen instrument to proclaim salvation to the nations of the earth. He also proclaimed the deliverance of his people 430 years down the line. These promises were repeated to Abram upon several different occasions over a space of nearly half a century. God loves to repeat his promises. And there are a few thousand promises in the Bible. Please read them and enjoy them. Galatians 3, 17. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, that's the giving of it, the codification of the law at Sinai, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. At the beginning of the 430 years, God gave a promise to Abram. At the end of the 430 years, many things happened. And this is what we're going to study. What is Paul's great concern? The covenant promise at the beginning of the period of the giving of the law at its close. I'm reading it again. The covenant promise at the beginning of the period, point number one, and the giving of the law at its close. The law was there, but God codified the law at Sinai. Where else do we find this 430-year period in the Bible? Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And this is the theme that we're going to study. Exodus, deliverance from Egypt. God promised that it would happen. And here it says at that very same day, this promise of deliverance was fulfilled. If God promises you deliverance, he will let it happen. 42. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. 
This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. Exactly 430 years after the promise was made, the deliverance of the descendants of Abram took place. This is Bathsheba in the Negev. Do you think God would repeat his promise to Abram? Yes. Repetition is a common phenomenon in the Bible. You can check it. It helps us to be mindful of what God wants to do for us. God wants us to get the good news of salvation as clear as possible. Genesis 15, 12 and 13. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be, what? Strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Do you notice a difference? Yeah. 400 years against 430. Well, this was 30 years later. A waiting period of 400 years. He has already waited 30 years for God's promises of grace to be fulfilled. Isaac was born five years previous here at this place where I'm standing at Gerar, close to Beersheba, close to Gaza. Know certainly that your descendants will serve them. You know, before glory, we've got a few trials waiting for us. Genesis 31, 41. Thus I, Jacob, have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. So in verse 13, we read about his descendants that will serve others. Here we have Jacob who served. Did Joseph, his great-grandson, become a servant? Yeah. Did the servant prophecy finally include all the descendants of Abram? Exodus 1, 13 and 14. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. So the prophecy was fulfilled. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. You know, God didn't promise us a smooth way. But at the end, something good awaits us. And they will afflict them 400 years. Here's another word, afflict. Who was the first to be afflicted? To be, to be persecuted. Genesis 21, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian whom she had borne to Abram, scoffing. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian whom she had borne to Abram, scoffing. Scoffing who? Can Paul explain the meaning of the word scoffing? Does it imply persecution? Galatians 4.29 says, At that time the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. So scoffing and persecution, the same thing. So Ishmael persecuted Isaac. So here the persecution began. Did Esau the Edomite from Petra persecute his brother Jacob? 27.41 Genesis So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. 
And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. More persecution? It was predicted. 42, 43. And the words of Esau, her oldest son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Persecution. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Joseph was sold by his own brothers as a slave and later in, unjustly thrown into jail. Israel were finally sorely afflicted by the Egyptians after Joseph's death. Genesis, Exodus 1 says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict, persecute them with their burdens. So what the Lord said to Abram happened. God is honest. He told us that we will have trials and temptations. But he's with us during the hard times. Why does Moses refer to 400 years instead of 430? Because the 400 years of affliction only began 30 years later when Abram was 105 years old and his son Isaac 5 years old and Ishmael a little older. This would be about the time Ishmael was born after the flesh, persecuted him, that was born after the spirit. So here we have the beginning of the 400 years of persecution. The time from the call of Abram to Jacob's entry into Egypt was 215 years, which would leave 215 years of the 430 as the time the Hebrews spent there. Now I must explain something here. The Septuagint translation of Exodus reads as follows. This is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. You see, all this belonged to Egypt, Canaan and Egypt, was 430 years. The Israelites left Egypt in the month of Xanthikus on the 15th day of the lunar month, 430 years after our forefather Abram came into Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. This is what Flavius Josephus tells us. It's in harmony with the Bible. How was God going to handle this inhuman persecution? I love to read the story of God's deliverance. Genesis 15, 14. And also the nation whom they serve, the Egyptians, will I judge. There's a time of judgment. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Wonderful. Our next lecture will take us to the aspect of judge. How does God judge? What does he accomplish by judging? How did God punish the persecutors of his children in trying to save them the Egyptians as well as Israel. The prophecy says that they will leave the land of slavery with great possessions. We are going to leave this land with great possessions very soon. Possessions like eternal life. Poor persecuted paupers spend 
billionaires overnight in Egypt when they left. God's deliverance of his people from the bondage of Egypt is a type of the great antitypical deliverance at the second coming of Jesus. Are you going through a tough time right now? I will not be surprised because somehow problems are increasing. We're heading for the final climax of this planet. So if you're going through a tough time right now, I want to tell you, are you longing for God's deliverance? Yes. We long for deliverance. That's the cry of the heart. Be of good cheer. We are going to leave this Egypt of bondage and pain with great possessions. Like, for instance, a brand new body capable of living forever and move through space at the thought just like this. Like, for instance, a brand new intellect to appreciate God's salvation as never before. You know, lately I was looking, studying trees, looking at the leaves, the design of the trees. In heaven we're going to study marvelous things. We know so little. The greatest excitement is waiting for us. Take heart. Now we are temporarily poor. Soon, we will be eternally rich. Father in heaven, thank you for good news. We will be delivered from bondage, as Israel of old was delivered from their bondage. May us allow you to deliver us from hatred, from willful sins. In Jesus' name. Amen.